It's time to set the record queer. Witty, lively, bee swift rage, concerned, empathetic, nat, fungineer, aggressive, beautiful, chickpea swift rage. Welcome to Setting the Record Queer, a podcast where queer people talk about the pursuits and communities they love. This is episode 18, and it's about variety and charity streaming. My name is Alexis, my pronouns are it, it's, and she, her, and I am two of your hosts. My name's Kaylee, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm your other host. Hey Kaylee, are you excited for this month? What's special about this month? Well, Kaylee, (laughs) we are doing our first ever um, Patreon incentive episode. It's going to be called Rewriting the Record. It is a two-part special episode that is taking place for us over the course of an entire month. We just recorded part one last night. Both of us are going to spend the next month doing one of the hobbies or practices we've talked about on this podcast, something we've never done before, learning it from scratch based on our guests' advice and seeing how that goes. And then a month from now, when we're both most certainly experts in the fields of our choosing, we will regroup and talk about how that went. And at that point, we'll compile both before and after into an episode and release it for everyone. Our patrons will be able to listen to the before episode early. In fact, if you're a patron at any tier, by the time you're listening to this, that episode is already up on Patreon. So go take a listen. I believe also at that time, our live episode from Toracon 2019 should be in your podcast feed by now, and a bonus live stereo version where you can like hear where different people were sitting in the room is up on patreon.com slash setting the record queer for anyone, not just patrons to listen to. So yeah, I'm really excited for this month. I don't know about you. I'm a little scared. We talked about what we're doing on that. If you're a patron, you can go listen to the first half of that of rewriting the record now. Uh, Kaylee, what else is going on? You've been busy. Yeah, I've, I've still been working on SoulSync. Um, I don't have a ton to say. I've mostly been doing optimizations. That's actually not true. I've designed all of the main characters. But I've been, I made a Twitter account for SoulSync, at SoulSync Game, um, which you can go follow. That's S-Y-N-C, not S-I-N-K. Yes, as in synchronization. It's not, it's not the sync where you pour out all the... Um... Although, okay, I need to start over on this game. Um... <laughs> The soul sink. <laughs> please, please make soul the soul sink, S-I-N-K, an Easter egg somewhere in the game. Thank you. Welcome to Hades Kitchen, and here we have the soul sink. <laughs> 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 I like this game better. I'm starting over. Development scrapped. Yeah, it's don't go follow that now. Twitter, because it's already going to be deleted by the time you get to it. Uh, go follow, follow soul sink game, S-I-N-K. <laughs> I, I, I need to grab don't. that Twitter account before someone else does now. <laughs> Uh, what else? Uh, we're heading to the great, the great white land of Canada pretty soon for Anime North 2019. Uh, there's going to be another Games Finished Adequately speedrunning event that I'm going to be helping with tech for. Uh, and Kaylee's going to be playing a video game at it, yeah? Yeah. Oh, gosh. This probably, this might be the last in-person speedrunning marathon I ever do that's yeah. not affiliated with Speedruns Rochester, potentially. But yeah, I'm going to be playing Wario Land. At- so if you live near Toronto and come in Anime North, come watch Kaylee play a virtual boy game. It'll be real cool. Also, come find me. I'll be around. Um, I might be in my Magnemite Master cosplay. We'll see. Uh, what else? Uh, we had the third Speedruns Rochester Mystery Tournament recently. I helped show run that whole shebang. So, Kaylee, you played the video games. Yeah, what, did, my... what did you think of our choices? So, okay, first of all, Rollo to the Rescue is a bad video game. Almost everything was on the <laughs> Sega Genesis, a bad console. No, I'm kidding. We love the Genesis. We here on this podcast love the Genesis. And my team, the Cheaters, won. Yeah. We played fairly, probably. 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 You cheated yourselves by not cheating, but, like, yeah, you played fairly. Yeah, we had a good time, though. Speaking of playing video games, uh, this is a very exciting episode of this podcast because we have procured the single most wonderful and positive person on the entire planet. The one, the only, hi Skybills, we love you. 
Hello, you all. I love you, too. I'm Sky Bills. You can call me Sky. My pronouns are she, her, and I speedrun. I do variety streaming, and I also play Magic the Gathering Arena. Yeah, and lest, lest we forget, you take all of that skill and you put it into, like, amazingly successful charity events. Like, how much money have you raised for St. Jude now? Uh, we are now officially over $30,000 in the past four years already. And we had day zero last night and raised about $900 already on day zero. And it was just unbelievable, the support. So yeah, really looking forward and going to be doing this entire event over the course of this week. Uh, we have April 27th through May 5th, and we have an in-person speedrunning component of that on May 3rd. So very excited Ooh. about that. Fun, fun, fun. So... Sky, you've taken quite like a long and winding path to, I think, get where you have uh, as a streamer. I remember watching you play video games in like 2014. I remember sitting there and being like, wow, if this pretty girl on the internet can play video games, then I can too. Like unironically, Sky is someone who inspired me to get to where I am now, which is a big part of why I'm so excited for this episode. But uh, Sky, why don't you tell us, uh, give us the lowdown on your history with like streaming and how you got from where you started to all of the things that you do now. So I started streaming because I felt like I could play video games faster than some of the people I've seen at retro marathons. And I thought to myself, if these people can do this, I can do this as well. I've been playing retro games my whole life. I believe I started at the age of three, running um, Super Mario Brothers 3 and playing it pretty well for the most part. And then as I got older, I had learned the Legend of Zelda series as well as the Castlevania series, all Ness Ness growing up. Sorry, Genesis, I still have some love for you too, but not unfortunately <laughs> growing up. But uh, yeah, so when I had done this back in 2014, as Alexis had stated, I had taken up uh, Super Mario Brothers 3 and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie, which was a beat-em-up that I had rented from the video store. Shoutouts to video store rentals growing up. That is always a conversation I like to have with people. Mm-hmm. Those were still around at that point? Oh, yeah. Just barely, but yes. No, video rental stores were a magical place because you didn't want to invest all of your money. And I believe cartridges were, I don't know, $50, $60 at the time. Pretty expensive. So you wanted to make sure you were happy with your investment. So I began speedrunning video games. And over the course of time, I had submitted to marathons, some I'd gotten into, some I had not gotten into. And I thought to myself, speedrunning is very tiring. If you've talked to any speedrunner, it is absolutely exhausting. And throughout the years, it begins to wear on you. It begins to wear on your wrists. And I thought to myself, well, is there anything else I can begin to do? I picked up randomizers. And what randomizers are is those are retro games that have been rewritten by people to have a random output each time. So Zelda 1, Mario 3, Ocarina of Time, those were all randomizers that I had used. So instead of having the same repetitive wrist motions over and over that you would get from speedrunning, I took up these randomizers. And those did end up being uh, much better on my wrists as well. One other thing that I had picked up growing up besides video games was playing cards. I'd started Pokemon at about the age of eight or nine, and then I had done Yu-Gi-Oh! maybe about three to five years after that, and I played Yu-Gi-Oh! for about ten years, pretty competitively as well. And then I picked Sky up- Bills is my favorite Yu-Gi-Oh! anime protagonist. Aww. I'd actually had tried to run Forbidden Memories at one point, too, on that note. I remember- I remember the comfy card game <laughs> streams. Those might still be around at some point, all right? I, I'm not finished. I'd like to end up on the leaderboard, even if it's not a great time, but that game is impossible to finish if you try to do it <laughs> without card manipulation. And then I had picked up Magic the Gathering in grad school, and I had done that just to be able to blow some steam off whenever I had gotten stressed out, and grad school is one of the most stressful things someone can go through, at least something that I have been through recently. So, uh... What had happened was a friend of mine, uh, Friday, she had recommended to me, why don't you pick up Arena? I have a super early beta code, so she had given me that. And I started playing Magic Arena online, and it was something I was very passionate about. It was something that didn't wear out my wrists, and the community had welcomed me with open arms, especially uh, Wizards of the Coast in particular, and now my esports team, game, Team Genji, as well. So... That is how I had gotten established in all of these things. And St. Jude in particular, my charity event, that had began uh, four years ago at this point. And I can't believe it has been that long, but it has been that long. So the first ever St. Jude 
I didn't know what I was doing going into it. I had never run a charity event. My only familiarity was on a big scale with Games Done Quick. And what I had wanted to do with that is just raise as much money for my favorite charity. Ended up raising $5,000 that year. And immediately after that, or very shortly after that, I had been, um, I had an application for partnership with Twitch and I had became accepted considering that I was a one-person show at the time and the success of the St. Jude event was pretty massive considering uh, how small my stream was at the time. So that is a long and short history of what I do on streaming. Yeah, let's uh, let's get into a bit more detail of um, each stage of that. So um, the first thing you did was speedrunning, um, as you said. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit more about what games you've speedrun uh, and your experiences with the community, with events you've attended, events you haven't attended, but have impacted you, and the actual speeding of run. I, I also think uh, one thing that I'd be interested to sort of hear about is, like, how, I mean, maybe I'm not the person to be telling this to, but at least for the sake of our listeners, how does one stream a speed run well? Anyone can play a video game fast. How do you do it in a way that's entertaining and rewarding for people to watch? And then, you know, you go and translate that into these big charity events. How, do, how does one bridge that gap? I actually think that that is one of the best questions anyone's ever asked me about speedrunning. And one of the answers that I would have for that is, is to not become so reset happy. You know, the reset button becomes our best friend because we want that world record. We want to show that we can do it. But at the same time... You're also streaming and you're entertaining. So you kind of have to pick and choose your battles with the reset button. And I feel like that had helped people watch me speed run over others. So what I would do is I would make sure, all right, is this a major error? Is this a minor error? I would look at every single time I split. And if it seemed reasonable or if it seemed like the run had something funny in it, something I may have wanted to preserve, I kept going with that. Also, too, to not focus entirely on the mechanics of the speed run proper all the time, because people have seen this run, you know, I think lost levels racked up close to uh, 1,500 attempts by the time I was done. So I would just ask people about their day, ask people about their plans, uh, maybe talk about things that are going on in, within the communities to keep the conversation just flowing. You know, even if past a reset, I'll keep talking as if the conversation had never ended. And it was just taking the focus off of the um, mechanics, unless somebody had asked me a question. I was more than happy to answer that, but just keeping conversation casual, I think, is the best way that I was able to speedrun for so long. Because again, I cannot stress this enough, speedrunning is stressful, it's a daunting task, it's something that's very taxing on your hands. So keeping all of these things in line, I feel, was what had me speedrunning as long as I did. I had found out that as much as I do like speedrunning, I actually like talking about these games more. So this is a perfect segue, actually, uh, with Alexis's question about uh, how do you keep speedrunning fresh? What do you do while you're speedrunning? So what I would do here is I actually enjoy talking about the games. I enjoy talking about all of these split-second decisions somebody has to make while speedrunning. So what I would do with that is I thought to myself, why don't I audition to host? So hosting has been a huge passion of mine. And that's something I've done not only just for GDK, but I've done it for a variety of events, online events, charity events, Calithon. You know, it's just something I've always enjoyed doing. And I hope to take forward eventually into Magic the Gathering as well. So hosting has been a big thing. As far as communities are concerned, the communities and the attitude around the communities have actually influenced which ones I would like to be a part of. Uh, if a community I felt was either too big or it was too just... I don't know, populated, I would like to move on with games with smaller communities. So that was one of the many reasons why I moved into Castlevania 3 speedrunning, because I did like a ton of people who ran the game, and let's face it, Sypha is one of the best video game protagonists of all time. Sypha, our favorite trans icon. Absolutely. Siphon needs to get some more love. One of my motivations for picking up Castlevania 3, should I ever do it again, is to run Sypha and run Sypha well at a marathon, because... There is a jump in that that has been a fear of mine, and I've never nailed it the first time in a marathon. And I feel like A, I need to do it, and B, I need to do Cypher right. I need to represent Cypher well. 
in a marathon. So that is something I still have yet to do, something I have still have yet to scratch off the list. And just like with anything else in life, it's one of those, if you're afraid of it, just go for it anyways. And that's something I need to remember going forward. Cool. So I guess let's move on to talking a little bit about randomizers, sort of the same question. Um, for those of our listeners who aren't haven't really been in tune with like the speedrunning community, randomizers are huge. And I think it's pretty safe to say a lot of it is based on the presentation and the watching of randomizers as much, if not more than playing them. Uh, so Sky, with all of your experience in randomizers, how do you stream a randomizer well, you know, both as a solo streamer and then like as a racer and like an event person? What, what do you do to make uh, doing randomizers so entertaining and what properties does, do randomizers have that keep them so interesting? One of the most important key components to playing a randomizer on stream is to have a core group of people to race with because solo is fun and all, but after maybe about a week or two of it, unless there was really that one seed that stood out, gets very stale very quickly. So establishing a group of people and racing and making sure you balance chat comments with the people that you're in um, Discord call with, that is all uh, creates a community feel to it. And with that community feel, people want to be in the chat because they feel like they are in on that community. And when something funny happens, everybody will laugh together. When something really unfortunate happens, we will all be salty together. So there's <laughs> that shared feeling, that shared community. And that's why I streamed Zelda 1 Randomizer for, yes, it was two years of almost every night racing with the same group of people uh, and keeping that group of people as cozy as possible and making sure that there is a clear set of rules because again, uh, keeping things PG-13, keeping things fairly family friendly has always been very important to be as inclusive as possible and make everybody feel like they're welcome. And I think that was something that always kept people coming back. The fact that I did care about everybody in chat. If something didn't go right, I called them out immediately on it and uh, I made sure it never happened again. So just having that clear community feel was really important. I had done several tournaments. The only problem with tournaments is you have to close the chat for obvious reasons. They don't want any cheating to go on. And while a tournament or two here and there is fun, some of these tournaments stretched out into to eight, nine months. No exaggeration. Uh, you get the, you know, the six, you know, Swiss bracket, and then you have double elimination if you were to make the other bracket. And it's just, it was long. It was a long time to keep chat closed. And while it was exciting to do a couple of times, I figured having that small personal group is definitely the best way to stream randomizers and making sure that that group stays small and it doesn't get to be too many voices in the chat because you can have the other extreme as well. So keeping things personal, keeping things as community friendly as possible, keeping things as clean as possible on the stream. And uh, that kept my stream going for a couple of years until I finally decided I, I wanted to do some randomizers still, but I wanted to step into MTG Arena as one of the bigger games now on Twitch, just to bring that same warm, comfy community feel to that community now. So, yeah, let's talk. Let's talk more about that. Um, um, for those who don't know, uh, Arena is the kind of digital version of the very popular card game Magic: The Gathering that's been around for literally as long as I've been alive. If you've ever played Hearthstone, um, it's like that, but with a card game that existed before being a digital card game. Um, and for those who aren't aware, Sky is one of the best players out there. She won't say she is, but she is. That is not an exaggeration. I watched her, I watched her three for four Magic the Gathering pro player at TwitchCon. It was incredible. If you're not going to brag, Sky, I'm going to brag for you and you can't stop me. You know, <laughs> I mean, I will, I will say statistics all day, but I, I cannot, as a new player in the community, talk myself up quite too much. But... It's okay, we'll do it for you. <laughs> all right, all right, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> so what are you hiring us as your official hype girls? <laughs> I mean, that's a great idea, actually. It's something I should look into budget-wise, I would think. <laughs> uh we played we we actually played at, at the, the physical game at calathon and i didn't have a chance <laughs> but let's uh let's kind of you you mentioned briefly how you got into it but let's talk about your you know history with specifically arena and how that's kind of grown for you all right so i had started arena I, again from a friend who had given me the code and i moved to an area where there were no card shops 
So I was not able to play Magic, except if I went to an event where there would be friends with decks also, much similar to what we did at Calithon. So when I had played Arena, I felt this feeling of, oh my goodness, I can play Magic again. It's beautiful to look at. The uh, animations are amazing. That's something that you can't even get in the pay for game. You don't get this huge thing like coming out of the card with horns and claws and everything. You know, that's something that's that's beautiful about Arena. The game comes to life. And I was really impressed with Arena's UI when I've watched you play some matches as someone who has no expertise in this sort of thing, but just has strong feelings about like UI and UX and stuff in general. I was really impressed. And I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned that too, Alexis, because in terms of viewers, if you've ever watched a Paper Magic tournament, because those have been streamed on Twitch as well, there was just a Mythic Championship 2 in London this past weekend. And, and going back to just looking at paper cards, it just, it doesn't seem to do it for me quite the same as Arena. You know, you really get into the game with those wonderful animations. And now uh, Wizards has also added uh, these new cards that kind of come to life if you pay enough to... Uh, co- in-game currency to turn them into like 3D almost. So that's pretty cool too. But uh, so this uh, this is going to sound like a horrible anime, by the way. This is going to sound like Yu-Gi-Oh, but I'll try to take my history of Arena from the top. When I started Arena, as Alexis had mentioned, and I'm so glad people were watching. This makes me excited. Maybe maybe I do need a hype squad. Maybe, maybe <laughs> I do need a hype squad. But at TwitchCon, I had played another pro. Wizards had asked me, would you like, as a sponsored streamer, because I had just become sponsored by Wizards, would you like to play against uh, a pro? And I said, sure, why not? That sounds like fun. I, I'm not afraid of names. I didn't know who half these names were. I was just going to <laughs> sit down and play Magic. That's what I've always done. So I sat down, and I ended up winning three out of the four of my matches, and I didn't even have time to prep for it because we were playing Sealed. So what Sealed is, is you are given six packs, and you have to make a deck out of it. Very quickly, too, because we had time constraints. And I had just done so well there. I had played, and my opponent kept saying, Sky, slow down, you're playing too fast for me. And I told him, I don't know how to slow down. I come from a (laughs) speedrunning background. And that made the whole crowd laugh. And uh, Wizards remembered me. Wizards thought that that was wonderful for entertainment. So then get through the holidays. I'm getting into January. Get back from AGDQ, and I noticed a... Uh, email that was sent to me and and it had and the, the big red letters confidential blah 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 and I look at this and it, it said something about a mythic invitational about a 7500 minimum prize payout but I would have had to travel alone so I I go to to Alth, my significant other and and I tell him I'm like I don't like traveling alone but this seems like a good opportunity do you think I should go for it? And and he told me, you're an idiot if you turn this down. You realize this. He's like, you're one of 64 players in the world chosen to do this. You are going. If I have to escort you there, you are going. So I said, okay. So I got over my fear of traveling alone, which is which was wonderful on its own. And not only do I make it there, but I had almost top 16. If I just literally fell a couple cards short of top 16 there. Which was ridiculous. That exceeded my own expectations. And while I did fall short of the top 16, I had made a statement. I had two featured matches. Both of them were good showings, even despite the loss in the second one. And everyone had just fallen in love with my game three of the first featured match I had ever won. Which was, I had to play defensively with red. If you've ever played with red in Magic, it's not a defensive color. That's all I'm going to say, just to keep it brief. And... I had stalled for a couple of turns, and all of a sudden, my deck comboed out in one turn, and I beat a two-time world champion, which was incredible for me. I couldn't believe at the time it was going on when it was going on. I was just myself, my lovely, expressive self, which apparently people aren't as expressive in Magic. This is what I've been hearing from all sorts of broadcasters saying, you were the most animated person we've ever seen play Magic. You realize this, and I just did me. So after that, and uh, shortly before the Mythic Invitational, I was also picked up by Team Genji. And the awesome thing about Team Genji is all three of the designated Magic the Gathering Arena players are all women, which is amazing because there's not a ton, a ton of women in esports, but it's getting better. And Wizards had done the same in terms of diversity as well. 
So I love the fact that right now in competitive magic, there is diversity, not only with women, there's a lot of LGBTQ plus people as well, which is amazing. I very much advocate for that. There is uh, Autumn. Autumn also had won the Mythic Championship prior to the Mythic Invitational, so I got to meet them. I fangirled over them quite a bit, by the way. And <laughs> I just, I was so touched and I'm like, finally something I can get into with a super diverse community. And it was just so heartwarming. And it, between that and my passion for the game, how could I not play Arena? I just, I love it. It's for me. While I haven't entirely distanced myself from speedrunning and retro content, I have to go with what I'm passionate about. And that right now is Magic Arena. I mean, I think just kind of as a note, I, I feel like you've understated to some degree just how successful you've been able to get with Arena. I mean, you said it yourself, getting invited to something like Mythic is no big deal. And you've mentioned Wizards of the Coast. I don't know if we made this clear. They're the people that make magic. Like, Sky is one of the, like, official Magic players TM. Um, but one thing I do want to talk about a little bit more you, is you, you sort of talked backwards. about... Huh? It's no big deal. Mm -hmm. You said it backwards. You meant to say no small deal. I'm just going to let that hang. There. I know what y'all um, meant. <laughs> anyways, so one thing I want to talk about a little bit more, you sort of, you sort of brought this up, um, and I'm curious if you have any more thoughts on it, how you came into mm -hmm. this uh, Mythic Invitational so animated, and so you said it yourself, so you... And I just find it really interesting how those skills you gained in speedrunning and in randomizers and in Twitch broadcasting sort of translated into your magic play and really allowed you to carve out something special. Uh, so if you have any more thoughts on that, I would love to hear them. Absolutely. And again, these are these are wonderful questions. I cannot state Thank that you. enough. So in terms of speedrunning helping out, I'm used to thinking very quickly and that feeds into randomizers because I have to make split second decisions all of the time and for some for whatever reason when i play really fast in magic it seems to throw almost every single opponent i play completely Ooh. off like it's it's fast to the degree where i can't even describe the moves that i'm playing my brain runs faster than i can click on these cards that's how quickly i'm making each move it's very calculated and very quick so again, speedrunning and randomizers together. And in terms of streaming, I'm always used to streaming in front of a crowd or hosting in front of a big crowd. So there's no nerves when I get into that. So that also helps because some people get nervous and make a mistake. I didn't know how many championships my opponent had won. I did not know a lot of the names of the people I was playing. I just played my own game and I played it as tight as possible, if that makes sense. You know, reducing the errors that I make and accepting the fact that I have to play with whatever cards I get dealt. So I have to deal with that and just brush whatever emotions I have aside, which again plays back into the hosting because you have to leave your emotions at the door when you stream and when you host off. And so I felt like I did have a bit of an edge in terms of just how do I handle myself on the stage? How do I handle myself if I'm featured? I was already prepared for those things. I really like the notion of just like speed running as a winning the Magic the Gathering strat. That's so cool to me. Then I guess the the final thing uh, for this for this uh, gauntlet of questions, um, the other big thing you do is these charities events. We already talked a little bit about your St. Jude events and how uh, how you were able to get partnered on Twitch because of them. How do you put together an event like that? And tell us what kind of events you put together. Oh. Lately, I've been putting together nothing but retro events. I haven't been able to mix magic in there yet, but retro games, randomizers, speedruns, those can all go in there. So the first St. Jude I had, I just kind of played what I felt like. What games do I not see streamed off and on Twitch? What games do people feel nostalgia for? Yes, Nintendo 64 games. I'm looking mm -hmm. at you in that sense. Two years was that. And then last year, year three... I had done an in-person speedrunning component where I could bring some people in here and we could make it look like the old days of speedrunning. Couch, group of people, kind of an informal setup. Just wanted to do the best we could and it was pretty wholesome. I think that's the best way someone had put it. This was a very wholesome setup and that ended up being very successful. So prior to St. Jude, what I have to do is I have to look at a list of games I want to run and then the list of people that kind of live within driving distance that would like to come and play. I screen everybody, make sure 
Um, you know, nobody's cussing too much. Nobody's being hateful. Those are all the first considerations that I make before asking somebody to come here. Because when people uh, perform in my marathon, they represent me as a person, just the same as when I raid somebody, those people represent myself. So representation is important. Friendly environment is important. And keeping hate out is also of the utmost importance. So when picking the people and plus driving distance, that is how I select my people to come here. So then uh, after that, I figure out to myself, other than the games that the people will be playing in my in-person marathon, what will make this so successful? What have I seen at other marathons that work? Super Metroid, for instance. I'm not a runner of Super Metroid, but often myself like to run that once a year just for fun. Can do the whole save, kill the animals thing. Anything to raise money for charity. So we will traditionally do that. Ocarina of Time, again, a traditional component of that. So then I look at the days that are left and I'm thinking to myself, what has been the most successful in my stream lately? The experimental day was day zero. We did golf with your friends. And every time someone had either gotten way too close to the hole without going in and way too close to the net, because yes, there is a hockey mode, without it going in and counting, we counted that as two bucks. It's always been a long-standing joke at the stream, but this time we actually put the $2 towards charity. So we did that for quite an amount of time last night. And again, $900 later, I said, this might be a good component for the charity. So it's whatever will raise money, whatever is the most fun to watch, whatever can be the most interactive. Marbles on stream might be another one I would consider as well. And that's one where people can enter the game uh, by hitting play on chat and then they can watch their marbles just kind of roll on so success of games uh again making sure i screen people and i have great personalities and then just whatever's fun and of course coordinating front page also with twitch i have to make sure i put requests in ahead of time and then people had approached me through twitchcon last year designed by humans i have a shirt so i i could ramble on and on again, um about what goes into these St. Jude events, but in a nutshell, you know, outside things like front page, so PR, networking, and then in-person events, and then game selection would go into that. That's a whole lot. Not that I wasn't expecting that, but it's nonetheless like, that's a whole lot. So the next thing we want to talk about is like the communities you're in. Um, and I think we've already touched on this just a tiny bit. So what I'd really like to hear from you about is when you're entering into a community for the first time, what are you looking for that's going to tell you whether or not this is going to be a good place to hang out? I always go for personality and I always go towards openness and friendliness because I have no room in my life for any sort of hate or vulgar or ex excessive vulgar speech. I think I should put it that way. And I always go for how does everybody treat everybody? Is it inclusive? Is it a loving place to be? Is it a group of people I would like to interact with on a daily basis? And if I choose to associate with these people, do I feel comfortable saying that I can associate with these people? And again, professionalism at the top, keeping hate out at the top. Those are top priorities. Regardless of what game it is, if those components are not there, I do not want to associate with that community. So let's talk about how it is to be queer in these communities. Um, specifically, I think we've touched on, on prior episodes of the podcast, we've talked about the speedrunning community and being queer in it uh, several, several times. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk more about mm -hmm. the larger Twitch community, especially because you're someone who definitely, you know, you interact with a lot of big Twitch stuff and with the Magic the Gathering community as well? I would say of all the communities I've been associated with so far, the Magic the Gathering community is probably the most inclusive community I've ever been a part of. I think it's because the creators, Wizards of the Coast, they don't deal with it. They very frequently, especially lately, I mean, let's face it, there's been mistakes that have happened everywhere, but especially as of lately, Wizards has laid down the law and made sure it is as inclusive and welcoming as possible. So magic would definitely be at the top of that. And as for the larger community, here's how I would at least think of it. I have my own community, streaming community on Twitch. I try to make my space in particular the best it can be while also serving as a great example for others. Example, and if I'm somewhere else and I don't like what I see, I do say something. Because after all, how are we going to make it a better place if we do not say something? And... It's 
really important because if we don't, it could the, the situation, the problem at hand could compound. And there's just no place for that on the internet anymore. It's 2019. Let's give it the program. Let's be as inclusive as possible. If we see somebody do something that's not right, call them out on it. And one of the best, uh, other than maybe magic communities, if you, you all have ever seen, well, of course you all have because you've been directly involved, but listeners, Power Up With Pride, watch it. What a fantastic marathon. The cause is wonderful. There are pronouns for runners that um, are on the screen at all times if the runner or runners desire it. And it's the charity is unbelievable. There's, there's no reason to not love Power Up With Pride. Looking at Power Up With Pride's example, I do feel like a lot of the problems that currently occur in terms of just, you know, bigotry, racism, homophobia, I feel like a lot of that, transphobia, a lot of that would be mitigated if we all followed by Power Up With Pride's example. So again, Power Up With Pride, that leading force, and the bigger Power Up With Pride gets, and it has been getting bigger, I do feel like that will have a positive influence on the marathons. And again, there may be a day in the future where we can say, look at the example Power Up With Pride has done. Power Up With Pride has withstood the test of time. And now we're in a spot where the speedrunning community as a whole feels very chill again. So that's something that, of course, we should all strive to be. And I try to lead by that example as well in my community, especially when speedrunning, especially when doing retro content. Leading by example is very important. Scott, you are actually on the Power Up With Pride team, just for the listeners' sake. <laughs> all of us are, <laughs> yes. even. Well, your staff. Yes. I mean, yeah. You're, yeah, you're, I mean, we're all passionate us. about that event because, I mean, I think we here can all agree that the speedrunning community has a more than fair share of things that suck a lot. Um, but yeah, Power Up With Pride, good. That's coming up in June, right? It's June, not July. It's that June. One's that's it is one. June. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Yes. I'd... I'm terrible at keeping track of this stuff. And listeners, you should watch that. If you love this podcast, you will absolutely fall in love with Power Up With Pride. Watch it. Definitely worthy. Every single minute of it is a blast. And I've enjoyed we working. Will... We will definitely be promoing it when the, the time rolls around. Probably for several episodes, like we've done yeah. for the last two ones, too. Or the last one. I don't think the podcast was around two power up with Prides ago. So the long and short is the majority of the communities I am in, very good, very inclusive, but there's always work to be done, and let's work together to make it even better. Great. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So we just talked a little bit about one event that's coming up in the future, uh, but Sky, in terms of like your stream and content creation, what's, uh, what's, going, what's going on? What's, what's happening in this community? Where can people hop in to do stuff? Uh, with what components specifically with my St. Jude Marathon that's currently going on? Anything. All right. Well, you've got a whole purview to discuss. All right. I'm, I'm very passionate Don't about this again. St. Jude word, Children's right, Hospital but... being my favorite charity uh, is running from today. Uh, currently today at the time of recording, uh, April 27th through May 5th. And the in-person component will be May 3rd. And we're going to have a couple of front page days as well. We're, what we are featuring this year is the traditional All-Stars race, some Ocarina of Time randomizer, some Super Mario Brothers 3 randomizer, featuring some very, very high profile people, by the way. I don't want to spoil it yet, but that Mario 3 randomizer day is going to be amazing. Uh, doing some Super Metroid. And we had already featured some golf yesterday, so I'm hoping to have that VOD up soon as well. Yeah, so um, this podcast will be releasing just after St. Jude ends, so okay. be sure to go check out all of the videos, because I'm, I'm sure the event was amazing, and you raised like five bajillion dollars, so great job. Yeah, this is actually the shortest the marathon has been, because there have been so many other marathons that have been happening earlier than usual, so I decided I wanted to get the jump on that and include this a little sooner than it normally would be. But I will be sure to put the VODs up on YouTube, and you will not be able to miss a minute of the action that way. And then as for my stream as a whole, I'm going to continue to keep playing Magic. Uh, War of the Spark was just released, which is the new set. And there's going to be so many new decks that are going to be out and being brewed. And even beyond this, with every event that there's going to be in terms of championships and tournaments, there is going to be that many more different brews and the game will keep changing. That's the wonderful thing about Magic. I have been involved with Fandom Legends tournaments lately. I am hoping that I'm going to be in one on 
Thursday, May 9th, and that would be in the afternoon. So I think that's a big happening going on on stream. And then, of course, Power Up with Pride as well, which I will be helping out with and which I'm more than certain Kaylee and Alexis will very much plug before then. So that's a bunch mm-hmm. of things going on. Uh, I'm pretty excited between my marathon and the VODs you all will be seeing on YouTube. And then, of course, the Phantom Legends tournaments I'm doing. Hopefully Twitch Rivals down the road. I've participated in two Twitch Rivals tournaments, so I don't know if there's one in the making, but I have been involved with that. And then, of course, the weekly Phantom Legends tournaments as well. What's your stream schedule? When can people watch you? So it's almost every day of the week. It's Monday through Thursday, uh, starting about 8.30. Special times for St. Jude, though, though, although that will be over. 8 to 8.30 is typically the start time, and I run until well into the wee morning hours. And then... Uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Saturday and Sunday, most of the time there's something. Friday is usually my day off where I go to play Paper Magic, but lately I've been playing on Friday, so Friday is one of those iffy days. Saturday and Sunday are uh, more watch Twitter, but definitely Monday through Thursday and even Sunday through Thursday, I would say, are the most consistent days that I stream. Evening Eastern to, I don't know, 1, 2 a.m. in the morning. That is typically when I stream. My schedule can vary. I may stream in the afternoons as well. So again, watch Twitter. Now that I'm done with my day job, I will probably be doing some afternoon magic streams as well. You should definitely make sure to be looking at that because Sky's a great streamer. Um, Thank you. But our final question for this segment. Um, How do you recommend someone get started in streaming? What kind of things should they I- do? I would find a game or thing to do, because Twitch isn't just gaming anymore. You can do creative. You can do music. Find something that you are passionate about and something that you want to do every day. It's almost like the kind of advice you'd give somebody before doing a job or enroll, uh, applying for a job. But find something you're passionate about every day and do it. Make sure you don't dread turning on your stream, because that's how you know you're doing the wrong content. And try to build a fostering, loving community with somewhat firm rules at the beginning, So you have that type of stream you've always wanted. It's very hard to change rules midway in. Make sure you start firm and build a loving community from the ground up with content that you love. In terms of physical equipment, uh, you will need a good mic. I recommend the the Yetis are pretty good to start out with. Uh, You also want to use OBS to record whatever you're doing. And I would definitely say, without a doubt, PC gaming is easier to capture than console gaming if you wanted to do retro gaming. Console capture is a little more complicated and depending on how much you want to put into your setup can be a bit expensive. So I would recommend probably starting with a PC game of some sort to see if you enjoy streaming first. And then if you're thinking to yourself, I want to go faster, I want to play those nostalgic games then looking into capture cards and consoles and cartridges would be the best way to do that. Well, you can always just use an emulator, too, for that also. Yeah. Um, for that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, let's, All right. uh, let's move into our performance showcase. Yeah, so what we've got going on today, uh, we've picked out some clips of Sky's stream. Uh, we're not going to play them back on the stream because, frankly, they really just don't translate well to audio, so we're going to link them all in the show notes. Um, and do go watch them. They're, they're some of, this is like the official Sky Bills highlight reel, TM, TM, TM. Um, and we're just going to kind of talk like what went into the making of this moment um, as a streamer. So let's get into our first clip here. Um, this is from Sky. This is from one of your magic tournaments. Uh, can you sort of tell us what happened here? Uh, again, sure. from the standpoint of someone who doesn't know anything about magic. Sure. Credit here goes to Wizards of the Coast, by the way, for capturing this. This was from the Mythic Invitational at PAX East in Boston, Massachusetts. And what had happened here was it is game three. So you have to win two out of three games to win the match. So I had won one and Shahar had won one. And we were going into the third game from what the announcers had said, that um, white deck. So magic consists of five colors. White, in particular, puts a ton of creatures onto the board to swing. So it's a very creature-heavy deck, and you're trying to whittle your opponent down to zero. That's the goal of the game, or one of the goals, if you want to get into the, the nitty-gritty of it. But to not get lost in within very, very, very technical details, you're trying to get your opponent to zero. And these little creatures that are on the board make that happen very quickly, unless you have a response of some sort to it. As a red player, I'm supposed to not only wipe the battlefield, but I can use those spells to take out my opponent's total as well. 
So what was going on in this cliff was I was very behind. My deck was not drawing well, as I had stated earlier, one of the components and one of the uh, ways in which to have a positive mindset of magic is you can't control the game altogether. You're only as good as the cards you have in your hand and the cards that are coming up. So at the time, I had to play defensive with red, which red is typically not a defensive color. You're, sp you're supposed to always be on the attack, also known as a aggro. So I'm playing defensive with red at the time, trying to hold off Shahar. I played a card called Experimental Frenzy, which enables me to play cards off the top of my deck versus in my hand, which can be very good, but very bad at the same time. I had, as they called it, whiffed or had two turns of inaction with the Frenzy. I am pressed down to my last turn. I lose if my deck cannot do anything. And suddenly I draw a uh, Goblin Chain Whirler, which is a, a card that actually has an effect attached to it. So the best of both worlds. And when that Goblin hits the field, it deals one damage to uh, everything in my opponent's side of the field. And because my opponent was playing white, uh, all of their creatures had not a ton of defense to them. Again, they had quite a bit of attack to them. So I had gotten two Chain Whirlers in a row and destroyed my opponent's field. And because my opponent did not have any cards left in my hand, I had turned what would to be a sure loss into a sure win for me over the course of one turn. Broadcasters didn't even know what to say about it. Like, they were so stunned. And the fact that someone who had had zero, um, zero Mythic Championships under my belt, and they showed the statistic. I think he had like 20-something under his belt, and I had zero going in. The fact that I had overcome all odds to win that match was a, a memory I will never forget, especially as a new player in my rookie year. It was watching. Do be sure to watch the clip. The the commentators popping off is really amazing. Um, so I think the one thing I want to talk about with this is sort of like you you reached on this a little bit, uh, but like your mindset and the way you play. Um, I know we've talked about it. If there's anything else you want to add, uh, definitely now's the time. But I do think that that moment speaks for itself with those schools of those skills of just like keeping it cool as a broadcaster. Yeah, the mindset is to never give up. I talked about this in my interview after that, and you can catch the whole video on YouTube from uh, Wizards of the Coast as well. But it was to never give up. I had extensive training with a coach for my esports team and now a friend of mine. Uh, for about a month and a half, the minute I heard about the announcement to the day before I left for Boston, I had had extensive training, and it was not only about what the cards themselves and the combos with the cards, but it's about the mental psyche that comes with playing. And part of that is it's just so easy to just surrender in Magic because it the odds look so stacked against you. But I rode that match to the, the better end, and that's the reason why I had won that match. So that would be probably my best advice for anyone who wanted to start magic is to never give up and practice, 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 no matter how experienced you are. There's always something to be learned, either uh, mentally in terms of life lessons or actually within the cards and the rules itself. Uh, clip number two. Uh, this is something of a uh, funny moment, I think. Uh, so this is a clip of Super Mario Brothers 3 Randomizer. I know enough about this game that I can actually describe this. I know nothing about magic. I'm horrible at magic. So what's happening here is Sky is playing a stage in Super Mario Bros. 3 that is not designed for what's going on in it because it's the randomizer and it randomizes in Super Mario Bros. 3, it randomizes what enemies and what power-ups and stuff you're going to be getting in the stage. So this particular stage, despite the developer's intention, had an enemy that I believe the community lovingly refers to as Boss Bass. Which yep. is basically an enemy that goes along the bottom of the screen and tries to jump out and grab Mario. It's meant to be in water stages. This is not a water stage. Uh, this is a stage that heavily limits your vertical movement, which heavily limits how effectively you can dodge boss bass. And so Sky um, is doing everything in her power to prevent inevitable demise by being eaten by a fish. Um, and it comes down to a do or die moment. Mario staring this fish in the eyes. Uh, Mario swings his uh, tanuki tail. The boss bass takes a hit, and on the exact same frame of gameplay, boss bass gets Mario, and it is a double. It is a double kill. Uh, and it was it was something. Go watch the clip. There's a lot of drama to it, and it's really great. I wasn't even mad about that, to be honest. Uh, so the best way to think of boss bass is a, um, you know, when you fall into a pit in a game, you take a death. It's a portable pit. That is the best <laughs> way I can think of it. I never thought about it like that. And, and myself in this portable pit had just butted heads and we, we both lost. So 
definitely check that one out. I've never, I think I've only had that happen one other time. And, and the timing on that has to be absolutely perfect. And you can't help but think to yourself after this, why can't I have this when I actually speed run? If I'm going to get a frame perfect thing, why can't I get it on a speed run? So that's where I find the hilarity in it. And I, I think it's this sort of clip that really shows that like streamer entertaining mindset of like this minor setback that had a lot of comedic merit to it, kind of drawing that out. Uh, what do you think, Sky? Well, one thing I had always loved about randomizers is there's no need to reset. So if a mistake like that happens, you can legitimately laugh at it. There has to be no resets involved, no time lost involved. You just, you laugh at it, you enjoy the moment, and then you keep moving on and doing your best. I've just been watching this clip on uh, repeat because Twitch does that uh, repeatedly because it it's just, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's really all I have it's, to say about it. it. It is beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. Um, and then our final clip. This one is a... Also comedic, maybe not with the same tone. So this is a clip from a Castlevania 3 speedrun. And so for a little bit of context, uh, this is also one that I get to explain. um, Because I am a known fan of Skybill's Castlevania 3 streams. At least in this particular Castlevania game, enemies can drop different weapons. Uh, Once you touch the weapon, that's the weapon you have. You can't cycle through them because this is an NES game and limited programming and all that. There is one weapon in Castlevania 3 that you do not want. You 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 do not want the 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 like the knife or the dagger or whatever whatever it may be and it can just drop randomly and uh Sky's in the middle of a run, she's chugging on, she's like super focused climbing a Castlevania staircase uh just going by a normal enemy just super regularly and just knife. And Sky just has this beautiful moment of just staring into the camera just showing the game her disappointment and again do watch the clip um so i think it's sort of like the same thing of just taking that moment that you know as a pure speedrunner would be devastating and turning it into something fun for a stream any thoughts guy well at the time i believe that was the fourth or fifth time a run had gotten thwarted by a random drop that night and I remember that was a stray night I had re-picked up the game because I love the game. I love the music. Let's have some fun with it. And just random drop after random drop after random drop. And that was kind of the last straw. I was not happy with the game that night. And instead of being mad because, you know, being mad, being negative, that's not quite good for a stream chat. I just decided yet again to laugh it off. If it's going to be a reset anyways, I might as well take my time to make myself and the chat reflect on the horrible luck that had just happened. And that is one of the scariest things about running any Castlevania game is your run can end at any point with a bad drop. Or if you're just beginning the game, maybe not so, but if you're trying to go for a certain time and you need a weapon for a certain boss, it just, it doesn't pan out. You you reset if you get a bad drop. So again, just one of those things where, you know, most runners would be salty, but because of the character of my channel, I can't do that. Even if I'm feeling it, I probably was feeling salt at that moment. Um, I try to turn it around into something funny. If people are going to remember it, let people remember it for something funny, not for something salty. That's, that's a good streaming tip. I, I feel like this segment was supposed to have more to it, but you covered so much of what we would have talked about here already with your impressively thorough question answers. I will say, Plus these clips, some good stuff. These clips speak for themselves. You should definitely make sure to check out the show. Go notes. watch the clips. They speak for themselves. I know I say this every they episode. They speak for Sky. But it's I always think. true. Well, I think it's time to move on to listener questions. So if you have a question uh, that you would like to ask one of our guests, uh, you can email us at settingtherecordqueer at gmail.com. You can contact us on Twitter at strqueercast. And you can uh, join our Discord at bit.ly slash strqcord, where you can ask those questions. So this week we have one question from Alex J in our Discord. How do you use and moderate chats on your streams? That is a fantastic question because your chat reflects yourself as a person. Because if it's not moderated properly, then that can say something very poorly about your character if somebody new walks in. You always want to make that wonderful first impression because... You could have an influential member from a bigger community watching. And one of the ways in which to know, do I want to work with this person with a business proposition in the future, is how they handle the moments that do not go well. So 
I run a pretty tight ship in my chat as far as language is concerned. Before 10, so people can watch with their families, I tend to keep the curse words out of there. And even after 10, I say, we can be a bit more adult, but that also means still keeping it respectful, keeping the hate speech out, keeping the really bad swear words out of there. So that is the best way to run it. And in terms of moderation, I have a Discord conversation with my mods consistently open. So if something even questionable happens, a mod can type into that and then we communicate as to how to handle said situation. Situations are handled immediately unless uh, I am in a tournament match. And even then, I do keep an eye on my moderation chat just in case something extreme happens. But situations are handled right away. It's not something we even dawdle on in the slightest. So situations are handled right away. Uh, Anything hateful or hurtful is removed immediately from the chat and timing is everything and making sure you establish the rules with your mods beforehand if rules change is very much of the essence. Making sure you do that, keeping them up to date at least once a week about things that may have changed people to look out for. And just overall, for example, if I want to keep negativity out or certain terms out, letting them know because they're not mind readers either letting them know about certain things I want to keep out of my chat. So in short, keep it as tight as possible. Make sure you do not bend on the rules even in the slightest. And make sure you react fairly quickly because, again, your chat is a reflection of your stream and who you are as a person. Well said. You'd be surprised at how many streamers can't grasp that concept. But Yeah, really. I would say, too, it's very important. Make sure you mod a few of your queer people as well, because sometimes there are there is dog whistling and there's slurs that can happen. And just having that extra person in there to say, hey, this is hurtful and it's just in disguise. It's always great to have a few queer mods handy as well. Very important, especially if you're not used to seeing what some of those hurtful terms are, just keeping those people in, as moderators in your chat, you know what, they're wonderful leaders there too, because if they see uh, a mod, a queer mod, then queer people may feel more comfortable within your channel as well. So by all means, be sure to mod people from all walks of life, because you never know what might happen in a stream. All right, uh, let's move on to everybody's favorite TM segment of the podcast, TM. Uh, Kaylee's question of the week. Everybody's legally mandated favorite uh, segment of the <laughs> podcast. Um, you're not allowed to disagree with that. Nope. So this segment of the podcast is just a normal question, the sort of thing that you would see like printed on a on a sign in the subway, just like, you know, are you looking for better auto insurance? Um, what's your firstborn kid's name? If you had a firstborn kid, what would their name be? Um, you know, where would you like to go after this train ride ends? You have three choices, ten seconds to decide. Just normal, everyday things in our normal, everyday world. (laughs) Yeah. But our question this week is, no concern for money, no concern for energy, no concern for time, no concern for resources. What's the most incredible, ridiculous idea for a streaming event that you can think of that would be awesome, but obviously incredibly actually impractical? I actually don't have an answer for this yet. I got a good one, but I'm going to let y'all go first. I want to have like a big competition um, where we recreate the like sets of many, many games and make people like play through them with, you know, like with some absurd assisted technology that like lets them do video game stuff. And I want like the devs of those games to just be like uh, competing alongside them. And I want to see like Miyamoto dressed up as Mario, like jumping really high and shooting fireballs out of his hands and stuff. That's mine. I I like the fireballs. That's a That's a nice touch to that one. So I don't know if any of y'all have ever seen the, uh, the 90s show wild and crazy kids. But it was full of just, like, these fun, like, mini game shows. So one of the episodes of Wild and Crazy Kids, these kids went on to Colossus, which is a roller coaster at Six Flags Magic Mountain, I believe. And they had these cups full of water with food coloring in it. So one for each team. And whoever had the most water at the end of the roller coaster ride won. They'd, like, pour it into, like, a big pitcher to keep track of how much water was left. I would love to do like a, uh, almost like a theme park related episode of Wild and Crazy Kids, but have like a GoPro and have that actual test be on a coaster because 
I don't know, doing some more streams outside seems really crazy. Uh, another one featured was how many times somebody catch a football jumping really high off of a diving board and keeping track of that. Just some really fun outdoor type things put onto a stream, but like not your average, like some really bizarre versions of these, including going to a theme park. So I feel like that would be pretty fun. My proposal, and frankly, I cannot see any impracticalities with this idea at all whatsoever. It is a Fortnite Invitational, but if you die in the game, you die in real life. Um, <laughs> um you're just proposing an all-out, everyone-for-themselves war. That's what you just suggested. Well, no, no, no. They're playing Fortnite. But if you die in the game, you die in real life. It sounds like they're just having a war. Oh, my. <laughs> Please don't actually do that. I would rather Meyer Sky's idea happen. Did you know that if you die on this podcast, you die in real life? Actually true, yes. Yes. This yes. really makes you think, huh? Oh, God, so I hope we never have a if, guest If you come up with a good podcast. answer to this week's Kaylee's Question of the Week, uh, be sure to send it to us on Twitter, email, Discord, uh, anywhere you can reach us here on Setting the Record Queer. We like to feature our favorite answer to every question of the week at the end of the next episode. So got a little bit of incentive to get those in. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, but with that, uh, pending any other final thoughts, I think, I think we bring this shebang to a close. So Sky, thank you so much for coming on. We've been waiting to do this episode for a really long time. And it was, I mean, bringing on someone who talks in front of microphones as a profession to a podcast was kind of like an expected good fit, but like, I'm impressed. Aww. It was awesome being here. I would... I'm going to miss being on here. And if y'all need me again, you know where to find me. Tune in two weeks from now for Sky Bills 2, Electric Sky Baloo. <laughs> Anyways, Sky, where can people find you and all of the stuff you do on the internet? You can find me at twitch.tv slash skybills, uh, youtube.com slash skybills. And then for some funny antics on Twitter, twitter.com slash skybills. And that's S-K-Y-B-I-L-Z, just like it says in the title of this podcast. Um, and if you liked this podcast, uh, maybe consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash setting the record queer. Our patrons can get early guest reveals, access to a special patrons exclusive discord channel, high quality or early episode releases, and even special thanks on the podcast. We'd like to offer our thanks to our $25 patrons, uh, Kadejo, who you can find on Twitter as at call me C-A-D-E-J-O. Uh, American Choir Boy, who you can follow on Twitch at twitch.tv slash American Choir Boy, and Violet Moon, who you can find on Twitter as at Vi the Moon. That's V I the Moon. Thank you so much to all of our patrons. Uh, we really, really appreciate you. That's why we're doing Rewriting the Record this month, and stay tuned for more of that. If you are a patron, you can go listen to the first part of Rewriting the Record right now. That includes if you go support us on Patreon right now, you'll have access to that. Um, so give it some consideration. Uh, otherwise, if you like this podcast, uh, please subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. Leave a review. Tell a friend. Uh, recommend us on social media. If you want to get in contact with us or talk about us, you can do so on Twitter. Uh, we are at strqueercast. Uh, get in touch with us via email, settingtherecordqueer at gmail.com. And come hang out in our community Discord where you can chat with other Setting the Record Queer listeners us hosts, some of Setting the Record Queer's technical production, and even some of our guests who have decided to grace us with their presence at bit.ly slash strqcord. While you're there, feel free to send us feedback um, or ask questions for us or for our guests. If you have a cool idea for who or what could be on this podcast or you think you'd be a good fit for this podcast, we want to hear from you. Um, the logo for this podcast was made by Cubotic. That's at QBTIC on Twitter and Cobot, Q-O-B-O-T dot Tumblr dot com. The theme music for this podcast was made by Thrill Me Music. Uh, you can find more information about her work at thrillmemusic.squarespace.com. And Thrill Me Music also edited and produced this episode of the show. The Thrill Me Music. Make sure to not edit in a motorcycle sound effect there. Good job. Definitely not. Definitely don't do that. It would be way too cool and funny. We did the same joke and last episode, but that time I yeah, had to also, do it. Yeah, also, I don't think it would actually be that funny. Anyways, uh, Kaylee, where can the good people find you? People can find me on Twitter, at Witches Hex. That's W-I-T-C-H-S Hex. 
Uh, you can find me on Twitch at the same name with an underscore between witches and hex. And uh, just a reminder, you can find my game development stuff on at SoulSync Game on Twitter as well. And again, that's S O U L S Y N C game, uh, not S I N K, as we've already discussed. Although I'll probably um, have you can that find... um, by the time this episode airs, although there won't be <laughs> anything there. I just want to sit on it. Um, and you can find me on Twitch and YouTube as Proto Magical Girl and Twitter as Princess Proto, and also find my new uh, Final Fantasy XIV in character Instagram at echo underscore white. That's E K H O underscore white. I post pretty G pose pictures, it's fun. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Um, our next episode, episode 19, yeah, episode 19. Wow, we've made a lot of episodes of this podcast. Is going to be about songwriting with Michaela Moody, a longtime fan of this podcast. I'm really excited. Uh, thank you so much for listening. That's all for this. Um, and stay tuned, and we'll see you soon for more Setting the Record Queer. <laughs>